welcome, friends, to Clarendon United Methodist Church. It is a great day to be here in God's house, isn't it? To be here worshiping together with those who are, are with us online, to be one family united in love. What a joy it is to worship God. To, uh, my name is Tracy McNeil Wines, and I serve as the lead pastor here at Clarendon Church. Pastor Nielsey is not with us today because she's preparing for surgery this week. So it is especially good for you to lift her in prayer and uh, keep thinking about her and praying for her as she uh, is off for just a few weeks and will be back joining us again soon. Let me extend a special welcome to you if you are new to Clarendon Church. We have family members for the wonderful baptisms we're celebrating today and others who may be either online or in person who are new to the church and you are our special guest today. It is a special joy to be able to welcome you in the name of Jesus Christ into the warm embrace of this church family because you're family now. So that's the way that works. Uh, today is a special day in the church year a day we call the Reign of Christ Sunday. That doesn't mean you should bring out an umbrella. It's R-E-I-G-N, the Reign of Christ Sunday, the very last Sunday in the church calendar. So we're sort of like at New Year's Eve, I guess. Indeed, uh, the new year begins each year with Advent. And so this is the last Sunday before Advent, and we celebrate the reign of Christ, the majesty, the sovereignty of Christ over all of the year, not just today. I invite everyone to find the little red book that is located along the central pew and to fill that out with your name and information and pass it down. Uh, it's great for everybody to do that, and we especially ask visitors if you would be sure to leave um, an, an email or a phone number or something so that we can reach out and greet you and say thank you for coming. So uh, we'd really appreciate that opportunity to give you a message of welcome. While you're doing that, let's take a moment to greet each other verbally here in this space while I greet the folks who are worshiping with us online. So pass the peace of Christ to each other as you sit and greet each other. Hello, online friends. Welcome to Worship at Clarendon. It makes a difference to us that you're here with us. You are treasured to us and obviously treasured by God. So uh, we invite you to look for the links that are available for the order of worship and for the giving page. We're truly grateful that you could be here today. Check in, say who you are, and uh, form a little bit of community online as well. Blessings. Dear friends, we have been focusing on gratitude all this month in our worship, and today we are especially grateful to celebrate the baptism of two beautiful children, Arthur Killian and Jack Bennett. Oh, does it get any better than that. We rejoice in that today, and I'd say that's a great way to end our month with thanksgiving, wouldn't you say? Please stand in body or in spirit as we join in our words of greeting. Christ sits on the throne at the right hand of God. Come, let us worship the Lord, our Creator. Let us offer praise to Christ, our Redeemer. Please join in singing the opening hymn, Hail, Thou Once Despised Jesus number 325 in the red hymnal.
repentant hearts, let us name our sins against Christ and one another. Sovereign God, we confess that we are not ready for your holy will. You guide us toward right paths, but we refuse to follow your lead. You love and feed and care for us, but we fail to love and serve others. Forgive us, merciful God, so that we may return to your fold and rejoice in your presence. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the Lamb of God. Amen. However long we wander, however far we stray, God's steadfast love endures forever. Beloved, be assured, in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you. 
lot of the books of the Bible are actually letters from the Apostle Paul to churches. Our scripture today is about a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a church about 2,000 years ago, not quite. And the first thing he says is, I have heard about your church, and I am impressed by your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love of God's people everywhere. And I thank you and I pray for you constantly. So how do you think Paul heard about that church? Maybe email, text, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook? Uh, oh, they, they didn't have a cell phone back then? Oh, okay. Well, maybe he heard about it, you think, by word of mouth, people talking, maybe some other letters, right? But he, he was hundreds of miles away, but he heard about that church and the great things they were doing. Guess what? Today, people hear about our church and the great things we're doing as we also show our strong faith and we love all of God's people everywhere. And, but today, they might hear about it via email or via text or via Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, right? They still hear about us and sometimes even by word of mouth, by people talking. But just like Paul, we should thank God for our church and for the opportunity we have to love God's people everywhere, every day. So just think of all the wonderful things we do with this church and things we're even doing right now. Think of the volunteers who keep our church going, the people who cleaned up the church a little over a week ago on a Saturday outside, inside. Think of our Christmas tree sales where the money is going to help people who otherwise might not have a place to live. Think of the, we, we feed the hungry. We do so many things and then our pastors and staff provide so many things for us, not just baptisms, but they provide learning and music opportunities as we heard from our choir, including Cherub Choir and Children's Church. So we have so much to be thankful for, so we should always remember to thank God for our church, and for the love that we can share with others. And we're going to do that right now in a prayer. So can you pray after me? Dear God, Dear God we, thank you for our church. we thank you for our church. We thank you for helping us to love all your children each and every day in so many wonderful ways just as Jesus says. Amen. Amen. The scripture this morning is a reading from Ephesians chapter 1. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may perceive what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe according to the workings of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It is good to be with you, friends, on this last Sunday of the church year. We've already mentioned today that the church runs on a somewhat different calendar than the regular one. 
the one that folks all over the world follow. Our new year always begins with Advent. And so this Sunday is the last Sunday in the Christian calendar. There's another difference that we see when we see things according to the church calendar. The year seems to beginning to, to begin in kind of a linear fashion, you know, we proceed in an orderly way, like we do in our usual calendar, through the events of the year. Only in the church, the events are Advent, preparing for the birth of Christ, and then the birth of Jesus, and, and then the coming of the wise men on Epiphany, and then stories of Jesus growing into his ministry, his teaching and preaching and healing. And then when we get to Lent, we continue in linear fashion to tell of Jesus' suffering and his death at the hands of his enemies. And then on the third day, on Easter, he rises from the dead. And, and the world is changed, made new. The, the future is changed for all of us. And then, then the calendar continues on and, and leads into Pentecost, the birth of the church. And then throughout the summer and the fall, we, we unpack the gospel of Jesus Christ. We unpack the stories of the Old and New Testament and how they teach us about that love that we've heard about expressed in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. It's all a a lovely linear thing. And then we get to Christ, the reign of Christ Sunday today, and we realize, wait a minute, we're not just ending it here. We're starting a whole new cycle again. In the church, we think cyclically. We think again about what does it mean to be on this place of praise and wonder and glory, looking back over the year, celebrating the reign of Christ, but but also what does it mean as we peek into the new year? And Advent begins once more, and Christmas, and Epiphany, and the teaching and preaching of Jesus, and Lent, and Easter, and Pentecost. And the teachings bring us back around again to this place of glory and praise, celebrating the Christ who reigns over it all. Our lives circle back again and again into that place of Jesus' incarnation coming into our midst, coming into our lives, your life and mine, not just lives generation upon generation ago, but your life and mine. How does Christ come to our lives today? And and how might it be different this year than last? And different next year than this? And and then we cycle through to all of the other elements of his life and death and resurrection, the gracious story of God's movement in our lives through this one who is our Savior. And we find ourselves again and again back at this place, perched in the the center of of a looking forward and looking back into the new year and celebrating Christ's reign over the old. We've been celebrating the gift of thanksgiving and gratitude in, in the month of November. <laughs> Is there anything to be more grateful for than the gracious power of God at work in Jesus Christ? We end and begin the year fittingly today in thanksgiving and celebration and praise. Thanks and praise to Christ, who above all else reigns over all. Christ reigns in power. That's one of the things we celebrate on a day like this, the the majesty, the glory, the power of our God, because absolutely that's not... Uh, absent from this God who made us. We love to think about the God who is our friend, our, the one who cares for us, the tender God, the merciful God. Today we remember also the God who is above all else. But the God who reigns with a different kind of power than the world 
seems to understand power to be. I think Arthur really just can't even imagine that kind of power. Just needs a break from it for just a moment, please. We live in a time when the world's idea of what power looks like and how we can use it are causing us much trouble and strife. Our nation's Congress is in great disarray as so many are using power as a weapon against each other. We see nations at war, both within themselves and at war with each other, with thousands and thousands dying as the world looks on in horror. There is much consternation within our own country about how we should use our own considerable power and influence and military might on the world scene. There is much strife because of the way the world uses its power. And I don't profess to have answers, great and glorious answers to these massive world problems. They're deep and complex, and it's so easy to fall into simplistic responses that will never bring us closer to a lasting peace for people around the world. But I do know where to turn to find what real power looks like, the power to change the world for good. Sort of like in the, the movie Wicked, where we think about how you, you can go through a period of change for good, meaning forever, but also change for the good of all. We hear in the letter today, God put power to work in Christ. May your high, the, heart, uh, the eyes of your heart be enlightened so you may perceive what is the hope to which he has called you? What are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe according to the working of his great power? God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and a power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. All things have been put under his feet and he has been made the head over all things for the church, his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The glorious power of God is opened up in this text. Power for us who believe, it says. Now, do you find that the best power in your life, the most glorious power in your life is military power, mighty power, the strength of your influence over other people? Now, we can influence other people for good, but sometimes it's influence, influencing people to make them do what we want them to do. Is that what resonates in your heart as the deep power of Christ? Or is it the power of extraordinary grace, merciful love, life-giving, nourishing hope? that changes bleakness into possibility. That is the power above all else. And so in the midst of a world where there are so many ending points, so many deaths, so many buildings destroyed, so many lives shattered, we still do not claim that there is ever a black dot of a period at the end of our sentence. In Christ, who was risen from the dead, we celebrate newness and promise are always there as we lean in to the gracious, loving power of our God, a power mightier than all else. We are those who seek 
to work for good in the world. We are those who seek to have our hearts enlightened, as the letter says, that we may perceive the hope to which he has called us. Ephesians is a letter which, interestingly, is usually referred to as that letter of Paul. And so as we talk about it and as we uh, talk in a children's sermon or in, a, uh, you know, in our conversation with others, we talk about Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Although it is uh, understood by many scholars, most scholars, I think, that, that it is not thought to have been written specifically to the church that Paul established in Ephesus. In fact, the reference to Ephesus that we see in our Bibles in the first verse of the letter doesn't actually appear in the very earliest copies we have of this letter to the Ephesians. It seems instead that Ephesians was intended to be circulated among various churches, most likely written by a follower of Paul in his name, as was the habit in that day. Unlike Paul, who always wrote to individual churches, the author of Ephesians was speaking to the universal church with Christ as its head, speaking to the body of Christ with Christ as its head. Scholars aren't of one mind when it comes to determining exactly when this letter was written or to whom, but it can stand very well on its own, speaking to a wide array of needs without regard to place or time or audience, and so we're grateful for it because in some ways it speaks to us today just as powerfully as it did to those who first heard it nearly 2,000 years ago. It's clear that some of the issues faced by those early hearers in the first century are still faced by us today. Keeping unity in the body of Christ, remaining steadfast in faith when the pressures of our culture pull us to falter and stray. Supporting and strengthening the Christian community when we're tempted to focus only on our own individual dreams and hopes and yearnings and concerns. The, the letter is addressed to Christians then and now who face the same kind of concerns. It begins with praise. In the first dozen verse, verses, we hear a beautiful prayer of praise to the triune God a prayer that we have been created in order to praise the glory of our God. And as the letter progresses, it tells of how we are to live in unity and love with one another. Christ today we celebrate as worthy of praise. We heard in our text, God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places above all authority and power and dominion above every name that is named. In this age and in the age to come, this is the one whose love guides us. Not just a man who walked this earth 2,000 years ago with fine moral teachings, Jesus was that, but on this day we acknowledge, we celebrate, we revel in the, eye, the understanding that Christ was that and so much more, claimed, embraced by God, embraced by us, bringing us closer to God and gloriously reigning as part of the Godhead. We celebrate on this Sunday that Christ is worthy of our praise, the one who reigns not just over the church year, but over all of time. In our troubled, our war-torn world, the one on the throne is above all else. This is a, a world that is marked by religious wars. In the past and in the present, we pray not in the future, but very possibly in the future. It's so deeply troubling when people of faith fight against each other. We affirm that the one who is above all and through all and in all, that one is love. So above all else, our thoughts must be guided 
by that love. The power of God is grounded in that love, that self-giving love poured out for us, broken for us in self-giving. A love that is alive and at work in our midst. A love that changes the narrative when we let it guide our hearts. A love that will not, not allow us to resort to lazy, simplistic answers when we face the greatest challenges of our time. A love that demands much from us as we navigate this complex world. The living love of Jesus Christ is the seat of the power of our God. So when the world seems shrouded in the fog of confusion, in enmity and fear and loss, with a lack of trust, with loss and and grief, it can feel overwhelming, pervasive. And yet, we celebrate a God who brings about light in the deepest darkness. Darkness never reigns. God's light always breaks through. My husband and I share the same birthday, many of you know that, and it was about a week ago. And so we took a couple of days to go up on the Skyline Drive, one of our favorite places, Shenandoah National Park, gotta love it. Got to see the magnificence of a November sky with all the stars and the Milky Way, just an amazing, beautiful view, had good food and wonderful times together. But one morning, we woke up early, got down to breakfast in the the lodge dining room early, sat right by the window looking out over the great expanse before us, the beautiful Shenandoah Valley. Only, we could only see maybe about 20 feet beyond the window. We just kind of had to imagine that great expanse, a wee bit foggy, a little bit difficult to even make it to the restaurant in the morning. We were sitting in the middle of a cloud, quite clearly. The fog. And so we waited. I came upon a a poem, I guess you could say, by Beth Richardson, one of our great United Methodist devotional writers, 37 years working with The Upper Room. For those of you who love Beth's works or The Upper Room, you'll know her. And she wrote this one day. The weather app said, dense fog advisory. But up here on the ridge, the fog had begun to melt away. I looked out the kitchen window and saw the sun breaking through the trees, through the fog, and I remembered how love breaks through shadows, fears, despair. Light and love break through walls of hate, break into hearts frozen by hopelessness, Holy One, bring us your peace. As we come to the end of a year that, oh my goodness, seems so shrouded in fog, (laughs) doesn't it? As we come to this year about to begin and peer into that new year, peer through the window, we can see about 20 feet right now into the new year, we wonder what the fog will do. But we, as the body of Christ, have in the center of our hearts a hope that acknowledges that Christ's love reigns above all else. So we know that as we take steps into that new year, as we live into that love, we begin to see the valley shining through, a little bit of sun shining. Some of the houses below come into focus, the farms, the Shenandoah River. Light overcomes darkness. Light and love break through the fog when we live into the love and gracious power of our God. We don't have easy answers to the world's complex problems, but our lives must be guided by this narrative of love 
that biblical word which informs us of God's grace at work in the world, moving through the body of Christ and moving out with love and compassion in the world God loves. May our lives be defined by it. As we step into a new year, may our lives follow the path of the living love of Jesus Christ. May God's grace, above all else, inform who we are and how we move into this new year. God be with us and with the world God loves. Amen. Oh, dear friends, now we get to spend time with Jack and with Arthur. We're going to let Arthur return to our midst and uh, invite the uh, families to come in a moment. I'll just spend a little bit of time mentioning the, the Bennets and the Killians are related to each other. Uh, Aaron and Allie, Allie Bennett and Aaron Killian are siblings, and so our, our children being baptized today are wonderful cousins, and big brother Henry is helping Jack to find his way in now. Thank you, Henry. That's just wonderful. I tell you what, we, we made a decision midway through the week that we were going to move the font down here, and the word didn't get to everybody. So we kind of had been moving it back and forth a little bit, and I wonder if someone would be willing to move it down here. Rather than just being awkward, let's have the awkwardness at the beginning instead of in the middle of the baptism. How's that? <laughs> That's right. I would think that we would already be putting them to work. That's a very good point. Very good point. Let me put this away here. All right, dear friends, and I'm going to stand right in the middle of you all. We have before us beautiful baby Arthur and awesomely cool Jack and fabulous Henry, too, but you've already been baptized. So what a joy it is to be with both of you as we come today to receive you in a new way into Christ's family and embrace you in, in what we call a covenant. That means a, like a promise. God makes a promise to you, Jack. And to you, Arthur, that you are part of God's family, beloved, deeply loved by God, and loved by all of us. So we're all going to become family together today. And in a few minutes, we're going to walk Arthur down. I'm going to, I will walk Arthur down the aisle, and maybe, Jack, you'll go with me down the aisle, and they'll sing that song. Remember the song I sang to you a couple days ago? Yeah, they're going to sing that song to you with your name in it. It's very exciting. And I can, well, let's get those. Henry's going to help. That's good. So now we turn to the, the narrative which brings us into this joyous sacramental act of God's love poured out for these two who come. Siblings in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We're incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. And so I ask you as uh, parents and godparents, on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? Do you? Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? Will you nurture Arthur and Jack in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example, they may be guided to accept God's grace for themselves, to profess their faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? Will you? Do you, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include Arthur and Jack now before you in your care? 
With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround Arthur and Jack with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their trust of God and be found faithful in their service to others. We will pray for them that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. I invite you now to stand together. Let us join together in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. Sing to the Lord all the earth, tell of God's mercy each day. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus, nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Declare his works to the nations, his glory among all the people. Pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and those who receive it to wash away their sin and clothe them in righteousness throughout their lives, that dying and being raised with Christ, they may share in his final victory. All praise to you, eternal Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, with you and the Holy Spirit, lives and reigns forever. Amen. Sound asleep, yeah. Yeah. Arthur Stephen, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Holy Spirit work within you that being born through water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. He looked at me. He's very nice. And now Jack. Here you go. I'm going to put water on your head, remember? And it's... Jack Killian, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Holy Spirit work within you that being born through water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. So Jack, remember how we talked about that water and how good water is, even better than Gatorade? Even better than Gatorade is water because it washes us clean and it refreshes us and it gives us life. And so we celebrate that God loves you so much that God wants you to be clean and fresh and have new life. And so this is your church family, and we want to sing to you. We're going to start, and I'll sh we'll show you what it's like first, okay? Because I'm going to take Arthur, oh, and we're going to all welcome you, Arthur, in love as we all wave and sing. Oh, look at your family.
we lulled him to sleep. Beautiful. It's so great. Let's go now. Everybody wave. Jack, Jack, God claims you. God helps you. protect and love you and your cousin Arthur and all of us in love. That was very nice. Wow. Members of the household of God, I commend Arthur and Jack to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. We give thanks for all that God has already given you and we welcome you in Christian love as members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Now, Arthur, and Jack, the God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and in peace. Amen. Let us pray. Sovereign Lord Jesus, come into our hearts today and take your reign. Remind us that in you there is hope, promise, justice, peace, and joy. You have called us to be your people, the church, living our lives in the knowledge that peace, justice, and hope are not only possible, but can actually be the ruling factor of the world for those who follow you. There are many who do not acknowledge your presence and your name, O Lord, but in your infinite love and mercy, you have acknowledged and claimed them. Help us to be the kind of disciples that welcome everyone with words of kindness, that offers acts of mercy and peace to all in need, who proclaim Christ risen and glorified. As we bring before you, O Lord, the names of people and situations needing your healing and comforting touch, may we also open our hearts for that same healing and comfort. Remind us that we are never out of your grace and mercy. We know that you will give us the strength and wisdom to be true disciples, and we celebrate and honor you now and forever. Amen. God is good all the time, all the time. God's mercies never end, and we have so much to be thankful for, not just this weekend which we, when we celebrated Thanksgiving, but all through the year. As a people of faith, we also know the joy of giving back to God. When we partner with God by giving through the church, we invest in the changed lives through God's mercy. So there are several ways to give today. If you prefer to give online, we have a QR code on the back of each pew. And for those watching online, that link is also on the YouTube uh, video. And if you pref prefer to give in person, um, you can drop your gift in the basket as you come for communion or at one of the baskets at the doors. Our offerings strengthen our shared work in the name of Christ. So may God bless you as you give. And now as we are sent forth into the world, I invite you to be certain, be absolutely certain to come to the coffee hour after the service downstairs because it's a party celebrating Arthur and Jack and their baptism and celebrating being united in Christ on this 
uh, Reign of Christ Sunday. So you can uh, reach it by the steps down in the back or by the elevator and stairs that are out this way in the room directly below us. A wonderful coffee reception together with refreshments. Also, I believe if you stick around after church today, you may be able to help put up the sanctuary Christmas tree and help decorate the room for New Year's Day, shall we say, for the first Sunday of Advent next week, and also for this evening's Messiah Sing. So stick around and talk to Lisa if you'd love to help. She would be a happy camper if you did. Uh, be sure to get some refreshments too. You gotta kinda do both, right? But that also brings us to the notion of the Messiah Sing, our 52nd annual Messiah Sing Along, being held here in the sanctuary this evening at 7 p.m. Invite your neighbors, your friends, your colleagues, everybody, family, everybody. It is a wonderful event that people absolutely love. But it's also one of our, our really important days for wel welcoming great numbers of visitors to our church family. So if you would like to be part of that welcome, then come before 7 or talk to Lisa about it. She knows where uh, you can fit into that. Um, or if, if you would also like to come and sing, then join everybody, or even sit in the balcony if you don't want to sing, sit anywhere if you don't want to sing. Just enjoy the experience. Singing or not singing, it is magnificent. Full orchestra, wonderful, this evening at 7 p.m. Um, it is important on this last Sunday of the month of November when we've been focusing on gratitude to say thank you to people who have, in this month of November, offered themselves so freely in service to Christ. Many came on the day, we had a great work crew to clean the churchyard preparing for Christmas. Wonderful team, we thank you for those gracious efforts. And then also, many are serving across the road at our auxiliary parking lot for our annual Christmas tree sales, which this year go to uh, all the proceeds, all the profits go to New Hope Housing, the, um, the shelter along Columbia Pike that we are supporting as a church. So it's a, an amazing way to do something good with the purchase of your Christmas tree. We put ours up last night. Amazing tree, amazing, amazing, gorgeous tree. So uh, the, today and next weekend, volunteers can still be used. Um, is there someone who would like to put their hand up to be talked to if you want to volunteer? Anybody? Like, who, uh, I don't know who's working on the team from here. Okay, they're, they're, oh, they're already over there. Go over there, and then you'll find out how to volunteer. Thank you so much. I realized I didn't have a way for people to do that. All right, so let us rejoice in God's grace poured out for us as we turn to our closing song.
grace of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit upon you this day. May it remain with you evermore. Amen. Thank you. 